Hi guys, so um, I am back here with another video. Now, I don't know, if you if you know me, then you should probably know this about me. Um, usually I do piano videos on here, but I decided that it would actually be really great if I could do um, some more theology videos, because if you know me, that's kind of who I am. I'm a big theology nerd. I love talking about that. I'm a Christian, so um, I just I love to study and to know the scriptures and all of the different things about that because I love the truth. And so since I love the truth, I'm interested in pursue, pursuing that. Um, so a couple of months ago, I read a book called Infant Baptism and the Covenant of Grace by Paul K. Jewett. And it really changed my entire perspective on this. And I know you're thinking like infant baptism, that's crazy. Like, I, why would you even bother or care about that? It's actually really important if you're a Christian because you have to understand what baptism is. So infant baptism is really important because first of all, that's like babies and stuff. Like if you have kids, you're going to want to know what to do with them, right? And secondly, baptism, like that's a central part of the faith. It's like, baptism, man. Understanding what that is and what does that actually do and what is that, you know, what are the implications of that, right? And so I read this book and it was phenomenal and I just kind of want to give an overview of what I learned. I only about halfway through it really, but I get the main point of it. He goes through a lot more evidence of all the different things and the inner workings of how it works and the covenantal argument and from the covenant of grace. And so there's a lot of stuff to talk about, but really the thing that I learned the most about it is some stuff that I'll summarize right here. So I also wrote an essay about it, which I kind of elaborated on all of the stuff that I had learned with all the evidence and all the quotes of the church fathers. And I'm just going to go through that in this video because I think it's super interesting. And if you find it interesting, then maybe you want to come along and join me in this journey as we think through this idea of infant baptism together. Um, I call to mind that scripture that says, come, let us reason together. And I think that is the thesis of what I'm getting at here is come, let us reason together and think about this issue ourselves through new eyes, not through any, you know, things we might have, have uh, thought about before, but just, you know, coming at it with fresh eyes. So, yeah, I'll go ahead and read off the beginning, and um, I'll elaborate on that more as we go on. All right, so discussion surrounding infant baptism is highly and inherently complex. To just ask the question, should infants be baptized, really comes with a cluster of questions, because the answer someone gives to this cannot be determined apart from their answer to several related questions. For instance, if someone believes that baptism takes away all the guilt of original sin, such that anyone who leaves the world without it is in danger of damnation, he would be inclined to conclude that infants should be baptized and for good reason. In fact, this doctrine is the official church teaching for the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, and to a lesser degree, Anglicans and Lutherans as well. If one's theology leans more evangelical, though, where hearing the gospel preached and responding by faith in Christ are prerequisites to baptism, this question of pedo-baptism becomes really very troubling. If someone takes this view, then the question can be seriously asked, why should infants, who as of yet cannot hear or believe the gospel, be baptized? During the Reformation in Switzerland, the first to challenge this practice of infant baptism were the Anabaptists, who over the years have provided piercing critiques going back to the early church fathers and arguing from the covenant of grace, met with vigorous defenses of infant baptism by those in the Reformed camp, i.e. Presbyterians, Dutch Reformed, and they were also arguing from the early church fathers, but in a more salvifically significant point of view on baptism, still much less so than Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, but nonetheless the importance of baptism in these traditions cannot be less. So looking over the defensives the Pido baptist position makes of infant baptism, it is clear that their position falls under the thorough examination of their evidence, therefore disqualifying that claim and verifying credo baptism, which is just the belief that we ought to baptize people upon a profession of faith. And obviously pedo baptism would be that when someone is a born you want to, you, when someone is born you want to baptize them as a baby. Um, okay, let's break this down. So of course, the answer to this question, should infants be baptized, like I said in the beginning, it depends on your answer to that fundamental question, what is baptism? Because like I said, if you're a Roman Catholic and you believe that baptism washes away all your original sin, it is imperative that you get your babies baptized because if you don't, then they won't have their sins washed away, right? And that's something that's really, really important. But if you lean more evangelical and you say baptism is a sign or it's a symbol, right? And we do this upon a, a profession of faith, then you would say, oh, well, then why would I baptize my babies who can't profess their faith? And so this is, this is what I want to examine now, is the answer to the question, what is baptism? So I think baptism is a sign, and it seals us into the fellowship of the visible church. 
That would be my answer. It engrafts us into Christ. It gives us union with Christ. We're buried in his death, and we are made alive in his resurrection through baptism. It is the means by which God works his grace in our lives. And so, in some sense, you can say it's saving, but also in another, it's not saving. So it's not as though just getting dunked under the water saves you. It's not magic water. That's not what baptism is. No, but baptism is the means by which God imparts his grace to us so that we are engrafted with Christ truly, buried in his death, and, and made alive in his resurrection by coming up out of the water. So it is a sign that points to the um, things signified. And so that is what baptism really does, in my opinion. And that's how I'm going to look at this. That's what I believe the um, traditionally reformed view of that is. And that is also what I believe what the Bible explicitly teaches. So we're going to keep going down here. So first, Pido Baptists love to make the claim from history. This is their favorite one to do because they know that they can say, oh, look, we have all these church fathers. Look, we have all of these people that agreed with us like thousands of years ago before you were even born. So you can't possibly deny it now that we know that all these different people agree with us. But see, that's the thing. Because do they really? <laughs> you have to examine what they're saying here. And you have to understand the cultural context and all of the context, really. I wouldn't say cultural. I'd say theological and historical context behind what they say and why they say it. You can't just automatically take a quote that seems to do these things just so that way you can try and manipulate them them to get your personal gain, which is um, communicating that pietal baptism is correct. So there's a lot of stuff to go into for the historical argument. And we'll kind of break, do, break that down and run through it a little bit. And I'll just go ahead and read off. Um, of this essay that I wrote a couple months ago. So, Pido Baptists would like to claim that history is on their side through the early church fathers. They cite men like St. Polycarp of Smyrna, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, and St. Hippolytus of Rome, along with a few others. However, this claim that all these men are in support of infant baptism, therefore validating it, is simply untrue. From an apology on infant baptism from an Anglican priest, Seth Snyder, he says this, Beginning at the Apostolic Age, St. Polycarp of Smyrna, 69 to 155 AD, a disciple of the dis Apostle John, alludes to his baptism as an infant before being martyred. Oh, does he? When administered, when admonished by the proconsul to renounce Christ and swear to the genius of sweet Caesar, Polycarp answered him, saying, Eighty and six years I have served him, Christ, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And he further goes on, Seth does. Now for ancient Christians and for the Orthodox today, service to Christ begins at baptism, as shown in the ancient baptismal liturgies, in which the baptizand, or the person to be baptized, or their sponsor, rejects service to the world and the devil and swears to serve Christ. Having been 86 years old at the time of his death, Polycarp's statement must then refer to the commencement of his Christian service as birth, that is, to his baptism as an infant. We therefore take Polycarp's infant baptism as evidence of the antiquity and apostolicity of the practice. Now, Polycarp's quote verbatim is, 80 and 6 years I have served Christ. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And you got to hear that and you have to really have some, you know, some filter on in these lenses of yours to be able to say, I see baptism in that. He says, according to the ancient liturgies, okay, let's examine that a little bit. Let's examine why he says that. Actually, since we don't have that much information here, it's not too much that we can examine. Keep in mind, like I said, Polycarp lived from 69 AD to 155 AD. This is well within the New Testament era. He was born when the apostles were still walking around. And he died um, in the very early church, like, you know, second century. This is really early stuff that we have here. But still, the, the question that we have is, Polycarp, what did you mean when you said 80 and 6 years I have served Christ? Okay, the assumption being that since Polycarp is speaking of his whole life, it can be inferred that he must have been born to Christian parents and baptized as an infant, therefore dating his baptism to around A.D. 80 and placing it, placing it well within the New Testament era. And this is most certainly a possibility, of course it is, because he definitely could have had Christian parents in A.D. 80 and had been baptized as a child. It, totally checks out. The Christianity was booming at that time, and it was going big like crazy, and so it's understandable that people might think that way. But there's actually an issue there, is that it's more probable that he probably just meant when he said, 80 and 6 years I have served Christ, that he served Christ his whole life. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was baptized. Such a common way of speaking doesn't necessarily imply his infant baptism. And now you're going to have to look at the Greek here because he wrote this, or he said this in Greek rather, and it was written down 
in Greek. So you have to understand a little bit of the grammar here behind what he says. A passive indication of being numbered among the saints by baptism is barely compatible with the active mode of Polycarp's expression, expression that is, his accent on, quote, serving Christ. In other sources of Christian literature, such as Justin Martyr's Apology, Martyr speaks of men and women of 60 to 70 years of age who were, quote, made disciples in their youth. And Pytobaptists are sure that the passive voice of the Greek verb signifies their discipleship by baptism as opposed to choice. Because if it's passive, that means you're not doing it. And baptism is something that happens to you. It's not something that you do. Right? So they would say, oh, that, that definitely means baptism by choice because they use the passive Greek verb there. But in Polycarp's account, the verb is actually in the active voice. But they still see infant baptism there too. So that is kind of the contradiction here, is that they would say, oh, oh it's got to be infant baptism, because look, in Justin Martyr's apology, it's passive. He uses passive things when he says men of 60 and 70 years of age who were made disciples in their youth. That's a passive verb right there if you actually go to the Greek. So that means that they must have had, you know, something happen to them, and that would indicate baptism, because you don't do baptism. Baptism, baptism happens to you. God, other people baptize you, and you are baptized into Christ. You cannot baptize yourself, right? But Polycarp uses it in the active mode. So that completely negates the whole argument that they just said there. They just tried to say, oh, guys, we think that Justin Martyr, it, it, it must be baptism here. Passive voice, come on. But then they try and say the same thing about Polycarp. Can't do that. Sorry. This line of argument, this reason doesn't, doesn't apply there. And so you have to really actually look at the context, which seems to be the Achilles heel of most of these historical Pido Baptist quote arguments. Okay. So then moving on to St. Irenaeus of Lyons. He lived from 130 to 202 AD. So not quite in the New Testament era, off by about 50 years, but still he is, um, he is very well respected, of course. He's an early church father. He definitely contributed much to the early church and to church in general, church history. And so it's very important that we regard him as such. He was a disciple of Polycarp and Polycarp is a disciple of the apostle John. So these guys are like really close to the time of Christ. You can't just negate anything they say. So it's important that we look at his quotes in context. All right, so he writes this, St. Irenaeus does. For he, Jesus, came to save all through means of himself. All, I say, who through him are born again to God, infants and children and boys and youths and old men. And so the Pied Baptist would say, ah, see, he says infants. He says infants. And guess what that means? That means infant baptism. So you got to agree with this. You can't deny. See, Irenaeus agrees with this. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. You have to examine the context. To negate the context and to say, um, yeah, I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, and just, I'm not going to look at that. I'm just going to see what he says. Like, I'm just going to quote mine the guy and he's going to agree with me. You can't do that. That's really disingenuous. And it doesn't, it doesn't really capture what um, Irenaeus was trying to say there. So let's look at the context. First, it is important to know the context surrounding this quote. See, Irenaeus is writing this in a five-volume tome, its purpose being to refute the false doctrines of Valentinus, a Gnostic heretic. Over time, it developed into a complete synopsis of Christian theology. St. Irenaeus writes the above quote while observing that Jesus passed through every stage of development over the course of his life. So I'll go ahead and read this quote again, and you uh, keep this idea in your mind. He's observing that Jesus passed through every stage of life, and I'm going to read this, and you, you know, think about it through that lens. For he, Jesus, came to save all through means of himself. All, I say, who through him are born again to God, infants and children and boys and youths and old men. Right? So doesn't that put it a different way than you would initially think it does? Because if you're coming at it with Pado Baptist right here already, yeah, you're going to be like, oh, infants, duh, that means babies should be baptized. Like, obviously. But... You can't look at it that way because that's not the context in which he was writing it. It's a five-volume massive collection of this uh, against heresies kind of a thing, against the Gnostic heretic Valentinus. It's not meant to be a defense of infant baptism. He doesn't have that in mind when he writes it. He has in mind the fact that Jesus passed through every stage of life. And so in that way, he redeems us who also pass through all the stages of life, infants, boys, and children, and old men. Okay, so... The phrase born again to God that he uses here, because he does say um, he came to save all through means of himself. All I say who through him are born again to God. 
So this phrase, born again to God, was by the 4th century, so 300s now, commonly employed of baptism. If St. Irenaeus uses it as such, it's difficult to say. However, there are other places where he talks of baptism as, quote, the laver of regeneration. Yet he always associates that with faith. In all of his other writings where he talks about baptism, he associates it with the laver of regeneration, and it's always associated with faith. But in this passage, there is no mention of either baptism or faith. Therefore, to impose infant baptism onto St. Irenaeus is an unqualified confidence in the historicity of pyrobaptism. It's far more likely that he was using the phrase born again to God in the context of his writing it, that Christ became man, restoring humanity into a new relationship with God, which is true for everyone, since Christ himself passed through infancy, childhood, and adulthood. Okay, so we see how they have also twisted that kind of a quote, and they quote mind him to try and fit their narrative, but you really have to look at the context. It seems to be the case for most things. Okay, now this is the last one we're going to do for the historical argument, though there's many more I could go through, but for time's sake, this will be it. Moving on to St. Hippolytus. Snyder says this. Seth Snyder was the Anglican priest I talked about. He gave a defense for infant baptism, and this is what he says about him. St. Hippolytus of Rome, 170 to 235 AD, is still more forthright, saying this baptized first the children, and if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. That seems to be really clear, doesn't it? I mean, St. Hippolytus is literally saying, baptize first the children. You can't get around that, Vincent. Okay, let's examine it again. Once again, it's very important to understand the context of this quote. This comes from a document. Um, the document is called the Apostolic Tradition. This is where you find the quote in St. Hippolytus' work, which is essentially a book of rules for the organization of the church, the conduct of worship, the ordination of clergy, and the proper administration of the sacraments. And so the Church of Rome showed very little respect for Hippolytus' work. However, the Eastern Church elevated it to a high authority. In many Oriental versions of this document, they are inflated with additions. And everything that precedes and proceeds this quote illustrates responsible people as the only proper subjects of baptism. Therefore, on this backdrop, this reference to the baptism of little infants who cannot even confess their faith, much less be responsible enough to do the things he lays out, is unexpectedly stark. Such that some scholars, like Kurt Allen, suspect, suspect a later accretion, which is most certainly plausible. So, just think about this for a little bit. The Roman Catholic Church, they don't like Hippolytus so much. They're not a big fan. The Eastern Church really is a big fan of Hippolytus. And so, there's tons of alterations in the texts. And you know this because you can see the textual variations through um, examining texts critically and seeing the older versions with some of the newer versions or the earlier versions with some of the later versions, right? You can kind of tell what things are added in because some things are there in the newer versions that weren't there in the older versions. And so you know some additions have been made and it was very popular in the East. Now what you have to know about the East is that the East is in support of infant baptism. They do baptize their babies. And so when we see Hippolytus, or sorry, yeah, uh, when we see Hippolytus being uh, picked up and like exalted in the Eastern Church as this great church father, it would make sense that they would try and make his thoughts more in line with their theology. So that way they could say, yes, he supports us, that this great guy supports us. And so you kind of see that here, is that in all the stuff that's proceeding this quote and all the stuff that's preceding this quote, it all refers to baptism with faith, with responsible individuals. You know, this, like I said, is a book of rules for organization of church polity and clergy and all this different stuff. So it makes sense that he's talking about responsible people here. And then for him just to suddenly switch for no reason in like one sentence or two and just say, baptize first the children. Yeah, you know, like it doesn't make any sense. You see, it's very possible that this is just a later interpolation. And in fact, I think it's evident and you can see that in the actual um, documents of this, the manuscripts of this book here. Okay, that was a historical argument. We just broke down some of three people that they would quote most um, heavily to try and say that their position is correct. So now we're going to move on to the second point that they love to bring up, the theological slash scriptural um, point that they would always talk about here. So they'd say 1 Corinthians 7.14. This is the scripture that they would cite, and they'd say, this makes sense. It says infant baptism here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read you 1 Corinthians 7.14, and you tell me what you think. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Really tough 
How do you get infant baptism from that? How? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's give some context. 1 Corinthians 7, this is the chapter in 1 Corinthians where Paul is talking about marriage. He's talking about marriage. He's not talking about baptism. He's not talking about the sacraments. He's not talking about union with Christ. He's talking about marriage. Okay, if he's talking about marriage, how do you possibly get infant baptism from that? Okay, this is what they'd say. They'd say, they'd say because of original sin, infants would be unholy by nature. But how can something be holy and unholy at the same time, referencing this verse, right? Because the last part of this verse says, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. So how can they be holy and unholy at the same time? Therefore, infant baptism is said to be the solution to that theological question. That doesn't seem very smart. The context there does not support that. You cannot just impose infant baptism and then say, oh, Paul, that's what he must have meant there. It's absolutely not... Um, it's, it's not biblical to do that. I don't think it is proper exegesis. I don't think that it is really a good way to read the scriptures with something you already have in your mind and then to just impose it onto the text. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so the basic hermeneutical approach one takes to reading the Bible should at least follow this basic principle. And hermeneutical approach, all I mean is how you read the Bible. Like, you know, or how you read anything, really. It doesn't matter how, you know, how would you read that? So if I say the sky is blue, you'd say, oh, the sky is blue. That's a hermeneutical approach. It's called reading it literally. I'm not saying that the sky is blue with emotion. I mean, I could mean that, but you have to look at the context surrounding my quote to see if that's really what I mean. If I just say the sky is blue, the most obvious thing that I mean is just that the sky is blue, is that it is the color blue. And so taking this hermeneutical approach, um, I think you should use this kind of a, a principle when you approach um, the Bible. Exegesis instead of eisegesis. And exegesis, all that means is reading out of the text. Reading the text and saying, okay, this is what I get from the text. Eisegesis would be saying, I have some ideas already. I see the text and I think that that text aligns with my ideas, so I'm going to put my ideas onto the text, and I'm going to say the text supports my ideas. That is improper reading. If you think that the sky is gloomy and, and gray, and it's all this sad stuff, and I say the sky is blue, and you go, oh, he must mean that the sky is gloomy. I don't mean that. I don't mean that the sky is melancholy. I don't mean that it makes, you know, it, it makes tears fall from my eyes because I'm just so sad because the sky is all, you know, gray. I mean the sky is the color blue. You can't do that. And that's what Pido Baptists try and do with this 1 Corinthians 7.14 passage. Reading previously concluded thoughts into the text can make it sound like whatever you want the text to say, making the original intent and purpose of the text lost underneath all of the theological implications read in. Such is the case with um, 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Um, specifically, as seen in, the, in, as seen in the text, they had, the Corinthians here, had questions about the children of a marriage in which one party of the marriage was a believer and the other wasn't. Interpreting this text to try and mean that since Paul says children are holy, meaning they are in the covenant and therefore should be baptized, is like trying to fit a square cube into a circular hole. Yet Pido baptists are confident throughout the catechisms, creeds, liturgical formulas, defenses, and treatises that this is the proper interpretation of the text, thus jamming the square as far in as it will go. It really doesn't make any sense from the scriptural standpoint. Also, we're going to talk about the household baptisms because that is a really important point too. Keep in mind, this is all referenced under um, Paul K. Jewett's book, Infant Baptism and the Covenant of Grace. There's a lot of stuff to cover. I mean, I learned a lot. It's about a book that that's thick, it, just that thick, but you learn so much from it. And um, regarding the household baptism points, all of them, um, that's an argument from silence, man. You can't say that it's infants just because the text doesn't say that there isn't. You know, that that does not equate to a proper hermeneutical approach to reading anything, really. Um, just because it doesn't say that doesn't mean that it happened that way that you think it is. Um, so that's pretty much uh, the scripture and theological point of view on that. Okay, the last point that they would say is the argument from the covenant. And this is a really big one, too. So the biggest ones, for sure, are the covenant argument and historical argument. The scripture one, they try, but obviously, since if you know your Bible, scripture says absolutely nothing about infant baptism specifically. It doesn't say that, you know, infants ought to be baptized. It never says that. So they have to come up with different scenarios in which we see people get baptized, and then they try and apply infant baptism to that in a way that makes it really murky to read. Okay, now moving on to the final point, which is the covenant argument. Pido Baptists would say that the covenant of grace given to man through Abraham circumcised infants, and so should infants be baptized now, as the two rites are synonymous in what they accomplish. 
From a Pido Baptist, this position might be expressed as follows: quote, "Indeed, God deals more. Indeed, God deals more bountifully which is, with His covenant people in the New Covenant, not less bountifully. The fact that God told Abraham to place the sign of the covenant upon his children is a testimony that his children were included in God's covenant with him. Does it not stand to reason that in the more beautiful, in the more bountiful covenant, the children would likewise be included?" Okay, there is an issue with this reasoning. The Old Testament is filled to the brim with types, that is, things that represent something better to come. An example would be manna to Christ. So you think of the Israelites in the wilderness, and they're wandering through the desert, and then they say, God, we're hungry, we need some to eat. And so God sends bread from heaven, and it can only fulfill them temporarily. But Christ is the real bread from heaven. He is the living bread. He, we, we take of him and eat of him, and we are never hungry ever again. It's come, taste and see, and you will know the riches of Christ. And so Christ is the fulfillment of that thing that happened in the Old Testament, where manna, bread, came down from heaven, and Christ comes down from heaven, and we are fully satisfied in him. That would be a type. So thinking about baptism, a New Testament rite, as, a, as synonymous with circumcision, an Old Testament rite, is to conflate a type with its fulfillment. You cannot conflate a type with its fulfillment. You can't say this, the same thing, right? So if we take this manna example, the manna didn't actually save the people. Yes, it was bread from heaven. Yes, Jesus is, you know, the bread of life, as he calls himself. And um, so in that way, you could say he's the bread from heaven, but you can't say that, oh, since they're both called the bread of heaven, that means that the manna definitely gave them eternal life. That's not how that works. This is an equivocation fallacy. You can't do that. So there's an issue with this reasoning. Scripture confines us to not think this way, because for that reason, Paul is able to write and say to one who has an outward circumcision, if not circumcised of the heart, his circumcision is effectively uncircumcision. In the New Testament, all those who are truly circumcised are those who worship God, boast only in Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's the well, that would, uh, scripture citation for that would be Philippians 3, 2 through 4. In short, the outward circumcision of the Old Testament is a type of the true circumcision of the New Testament. The Pyrobaptist position represented is above, or, you know, above that quote that I said, is in direct opposition to Paul's thought process in the scriptures. Again, from this, from a Pyrobaptist, they might say this, we therefore consider that the object of the prophet is mainly to show that so great would be the light of the gospel, that it would be clearly evident that God under it deals more bountiful with his people, because its truth shines forth as the sun at noonday. Indeed, the gospel is far more bountiful than the Old Testament law, but as was described, it cannot be that infants are in the covenant that requires belief when in an infants cannot themselves believe. So you see this argument from the covenant, where they would say, okay, Old Covenant is bountiful. The New Covenant, God has promised, will be more bountiful. So if babies are, in, are included in the Old Covenant via circumcision, then it stands to reason that they'll still be included in the New Testament because it's more bountiful. So this means more people should be included, right? The way they would look at that is that obviously only males, only male children can be circumcised. And so that means that, you know, now in the new covenant, women can also take a part of the rite, which would be baptism. You see, you have the rites of the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. The Old Testament being circumcision and the New Testament being baptism. And so they'd say, oh, look, well, it's more bountiful in that women can be baptized and that baptism applies to everybody. You can get baptized. It's not like circumcision, which is a painful thing. It's not like circumcision, which only men can get. And so in that way, it's more bountiful, but it also includes babies. Sorry, you can't do that. You're equating a type with this fulfillment. And that is not the proper way to exegete the scriptures. Um, so that is kind of three points that they would say here. Uh, actually, hold on. I'm going to quote John Calvin because he was a proud supporter of infant baptism. I just got to disagree with him on this. Um, I love Calvin, everything he does, all his, all his work. Um, Institutes of the Christian Religion is one of my favorite books. It's just so big. I can't get through it, but it's amazing. <laughs> um, so... Calvin writes this, Here is mentioned another difference between the Old and the New Covenant, even that God, who had obscurely manifested himself under the law, would send forth a fuller light, so that the knowledge of him would be commonly enjoyed. But he hyperbolically extols this favor when he says that no one would have need of a teacher or instructor, as everyone would have himself sufficient knowledge. 
Once again, the fundamental disagreement here is over this covenant and how it applies to us today. The type represents what is to come. And now living in the New Testament, it is clear that circumcision has been fulfilled in baptism, applying to God's people, being those who profess faith in Christ, his son. These points exclude the possibility of infant baptism as a valid doctrine and thereby validate credo baptism. Okay, so from all this, what do we have to gather? The book is a great book. I love Infant Baptism and the Covenant of Grace. Really great book. Goes super in depth. Um, really, uh, what's it? Really professional. Just incredibly um, professional examination of the evidence and all that kind of stuff. So from all this, what can be deduced is that credo baptism is validated and pyro baptism is invalidated. With all this, one can look at the sacraments in a new light. Hopefully not that new as to, you know, change the theology that is most true and correct, but to see the beauty of theology and that it lies in its complexity and simplicity. There are so many moving parts of Christianity, not that they change, just that they are all touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is so intricate so as to produce a wealth of thought and knowledge that seems to draw ever deeper, but so simple and that it only takes a child to see the beauty of what lies at the cross. So everything is stemming from the gospel. And the reason why this issue is so complex and why the video is now 30 minutes long is because the gospel is so complex. But yet it's so simple that even a child can understand and believe. And so that is how I'd like to conclude this. Um, I think I am thoroughly set in my ways in cradle baptism, but if any of you have any disagrees, disagreements with that, though I'm not sure who would, <laughs> if I'm being quite honest, but... If you do, um, feel free to reach out to me and I'd love to talk more about it because I want to really engage with people who are on the other side of this issue. So thank you for your time um, and God bless you. I hope you have a great day.